Well, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege to be here, but I have to be honest with you. It's uh, the circumstances are such that this isn't the way I would normally come. Connie, Len, it's uh, tremendous to see you here this morning. I didn't expect to see you, but uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, um, when I was thinking about uh, the song that was sung, Just Give Me Jesus, I don't think it had been a more appropriate song than that today. So God bless you. And I trust that this message will uh, help today. You know, that's the nice thing about the Lord. He applies Scripture to our lives when we don't even know how He does it. I remember preaching a message on evangelism one day, and a gentleman came up to me after the service and said, thank you for those words about divorce. It really helped me today. And I thought, okay, whatever. You know, the Lord Lord applies the, the Word of God in unique ways, and I'm trusting for that as well this morning. I'm going to do a little thing on blind spots. This was a series that I did some years ago in a church, one of the churches I pastored, and there are basically about, that I I looked at, about six blind spots that Christians have from time to time. And uh, somebody once said, well, uh, sometimes I don't see my blind spots. Hello, that's why they're called blind spots. Uh, And sometimes we as a body of Christ, we don't see them sometimes in our lives. And uh, so today I want to talk about this blind spot about being judgmental. Uh, you know, it's not wrong to make a judgment. We all made judgments this morning. We, we made judgments on the, uh, the outfits we wore today. And I, I was looking around today and I thought, some of you have extremely good judgment. And some... Um, could use a dose, you know, here and there about, you know, some, I mean, have you ever, have you ever showed up to work with two different color socks on, or, you know, or, or, you, or you, you know, the colors you thought that looked pretty good when the light wasn't quite as bright as it should have been, seemed to blend, and then when you got into a better light, oh, this looks, uh, this looks a little bit uh, compromising, a little bit busy here. Uh, it's always nice to watch somebody walk in with a paisley shirt and uh, striped pants. That's always a little busy, uh, you know, but blind spots, blind spots. In the text today, Jesus, uh, in John chapter 9, John records the story of this blind man. And uh, I'd like us to, to stand for the reading of the Word of God, not because we're so cool or anything like that, but we do it out of respect for God's Word this morning and to honor his word. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. You may be seated. Amazing story, isn't it? But let's, uh, let's get a little context because, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptics. But John is not in the synoptics because John is a, has written a theological gospel. You say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is because John arranges his material theologically. That's why some of the stories in John 
don't appear in the same chronological order as they do in Luke or Mark or Matthew for that matter. And John arranged that material for a reason, to make theological points. I love the way he arranged this in chapter 8 and chapter 9. Chapter 8, for instance, has three stories in it. Actually, Jesus is off talking with his disciples. They're having kind of one of this, uh, they're, they're having a real theological fest, if you please. In chapter 8, he talks about the woman in adultery, he's talking about the unbelieving people, and then he talks about Abraham and himself. I mean, he's into this thing. And they're taking notes, you know. I mean, if they had notes in those days, and they didn't have iPads or iPhones, but they did have marble postcards or whatever they had, and, and they were writing stuff down. They were enjoying this. And they were asking. They were pumping Jesus with questions in chapter 8. So when you get to chapter 9, they're walking into the city. And they get near this beggar near the gate. Now, the fact that it's near the gate tells us something about the beggar. He had kind of worked himself up the seniority line, I guess, in begging, because you didn't get the choice spots in begging sitting way back from the gate. You got the choice spots because you had been around for a while if you were near the gate. So he had been around there for a while. Everybody probably knew who this guy was. This was no surprise. And then we find out later he had been blind from birth. So there was a good chance that his parents probably sat out there with him in the early days when he was a kid. But here comes the troop. You can see them coming in. And, and, and just as they get to where this beggar is, somebody reaches out. We don't know who it is, but one of the disciples grabs probably Jesus by his toga and said, Master, hold on a second. Look at this guy. He's blind here. Now, let's, let's, just, let's just think for a moment. Who sinned here? I mean, theologically speaking, who screwed up in the family that this guy should be born blind? Now, that's an honest question, I think, because they had just been in chapter 8, roaming around the countryside, talking theology. I mean, we all do it. I mean, nobody does it better, I think, at times than people who are in the ministry, you know. I mean, I've had com conversations with Len. I've had other conversations with other pastors. And when pastors get together, they talk about theological questions, not how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Nobody really cares about that one anymore. But we talk about stuff. We talk about theological stuff. Oh, we, you know, it, it's all over the place in terms of theology. We talk about, we, we talk about matters of divorce and remarriage, and we talk about, you know, we, we sound like a group of rabbis sometimes, talking about every little detail and intricacy of the, of the thing. And it's after you've been at a theological retreat, the first thing you think about is theology. And so here's the point. You see, here's where that blind spot comes in for the disciples. Here's where they turn from making judgments to becoming judgmental because of their theological bias and their theological mindset. Who sinned? Somebody messed up. Let's find out who's at fault. They reduce this poor beggar to nothing more than a theological question mark. Wow. I mean, after all, we've been talking theology for a couple days now. So everything we see is through the lens of theology. And sometimes theology can get a little judgmental. Now, since I'm not going to be back next week, and probably after this next statement, you won't have me back, but this is what's fun about being a guest speaker. You can kind of say anything you want and then leave. This is, I love this part. But, you know, I know a little bit about it. I pastored a conservative Baptist church during my tenure. I hung out with all of you guys and the people. And let's just be really honest that sometimes in our roots of the conservative Baptist tradition, we acted pretty judgmental. And sometimes we still do because of theology. Oh God, that that has to get in the way and become what should be a precious thing to us sometimes can become our own blind spot. It's fine to make judgments, but being judgmental is something completely different. 
Now, that's the part where you nod your head and say, right on, bro, right on. Thank you. A child from the 60s. I love it. The, the issue here this morning is that we have to understand that our object in this Christian life is to help people to bump into Jesus. But before they bump into him, sometimes they bump into us first. <laughs> That's what happened to this blind man. He kind of bumped into the disciple before Jesus took over the show. Now, I attend, I attend, <laughs> it's a pastoral talk for, I go to, uh, a Starbucks. <laughs> on, <laughs> at Yale and Downing. And I love my little Starbucks. I'm, I'm kind of, everybody, they, they, call, they know my first name. I'm, a, I'm addicted, not only to the coffee, but to the kids who run the place. They're great kids. I love these kids. And uh, I've gotten to share my faith with about, I think, ten of them in there. Because when you're just nice, people want to know who you are. <laughs> but there's a, a gal who comes into our Starbucks, and she's blind. And she comes in with her cane. And I can remember the first time she came in, attended our Starbucks. And she came in with her cane, and she's kind of banging on the door, and she wasn't too sure where she was going and hit a few chairs, but that's why they give him the cane. So she doesn't bump into it. She bumps into the furniture with the cane. And now she comes in, she knows exactly where all the furniture is, and you know, and she knows her way around the place, and it's kind of fun to see her, and everybody knows her, and we all, hi, Edith, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> I mean, he's thinking like, wait a minute, I didn't think that through a little bit. Good to see you, you know, but anyway... Uh, you know, you, you you apologize for that, and you you kind of keep going on the deal, and and uh, Edith's become a regular there. People who are blind bump into things. Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Christ. And and I know the people of this church are hoping that somehow today during the message. And during your experience here at First Baptist, you get a chance to bump into somebody who's made our life different. His name is Jesus of Nazareth, and he's a pretty, pretty good guy. And when you bump into him, oftentimes your life has just changed. It's different. But sometimes we bump into some of his disciples <laughs> first. And sometimes those disciples can be awful judgmental. Sometimes they reduce us and some of the new people to theological question marks. I, I've just recently taken a position with a church here in this area called Flatirons Community Church. I'm going to be their director of mentoring and pastoral training for all of the churches. We have about 31,000 people that show up on a weekend. And we have seven pastors that I'll be training. And these kids are great kids. But I'm trying to help them not be judgmental. So that when they come, when people come to this church and they bump into the disciples first, they might find them loving and caring like Jesus did. What did Jesus do in this story? It's amazing, isn't it? He basically walked up to the guy and said, your problem is you're blind, right? And you can just hear this blind man thinking out loud like, we're making progress. This is, this is really good. Who is this guy? You need to see. I do. That would be wonderful. That would be lovely. <laughs> and so he reaches down and he picks up some dirt. And he spits in it. Now, kind of wait for it. Wait for it. And then he, he kind of mixes it up. See him doing that? And then he puts it on the guy's eyes. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. In fact, I really have very limited medical knowledge. But the last time I looked at the AMA magazine, the American Journal for Medicine and so forth, spitting into dirt and putting it on your eyes was not the latest cure for blindness. Now, I'm just saying I don't have a medical degree, so I might be missing something here. But then he tells the guy to go to this pool and wash. 
And the guy gets up and does it. I don't know if he's got his, like his cane and he, he's walking. And, 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 but you can, you can just imagine the mud and the saliva dripping out of this guy's eyes. And the people who are watching him go to this pool, which about is a block and a half from where he was sitting, according to the latest I mean, geographical things that we have about the city. He must have been the laughing stock of the whole town. But that's the way Jesus does it when he does miracles. You see, you can go through all the scripture and you can see that whenever Jesus does a miracle, he also appeals to everybody's sense of responsibility to be involved with the faith walk. And so this guy gets up and he goes to the pool of Siloam and he washes. And he comes back seen. This has got to be a great day for this guy. I mean, I'm just trying to celebrate with this guy, aren't you? This guy is having some fun. He's walking back. And then some people say to him, well, it looks like him. I mean, <laughs> these people just have a real tough time with miracles. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, it looks like him. but it, And the guy keeps saying to him, I am. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. I just bumped into Jesus. And yesterday, or just a few minutes ago, I was blind. But now I can see. So why do we, when people come in to the church or come into any other group where we're going to present Christ, why is this blind spot there for us? That somebody walks in with long hair or is tatted up or rings in their nose or bells on their toes or whatever, and we get so stinking judgmental What is it about when somebody makes an announcement in our church that says, yeah, there's some Muslim friends of ours who are hurting because some guy, crazy guy in New Zealand shot some people in a mosque and, and we're going to go over there and we're, gonna, we're gonna, just going to be their friend. Yeah, but theologically speaking, there's some real problems here. I know. I know, I know. But blind people need to see. They need to see. That's the fundamental problem. But maybe being theological and being judgmental sometimes is the easier road. Maybe it's the easier alternative and laying down my theology and still keeping it and believing it but in love reaching out Jesus was also the friend of who? of sinners wasn't he? he hung out with sometimes an unsavory crowd not because he adopted their lifestyle but he knew that blind people need to see and isn't it interesting that when people are blind, we too oftentimes are having blindness problems because we have blind spots. You know, I got to tell you that the sermon today is probably more for me than it is for you. I needed to hear this too. Growing up in a Baptist church my dad was a baptist pastor with the baptist general conference now called converge but we were very conservative in our theology at times our conference was kind of legalistic we were judgmental too i remember guys even had a problem when jesus turned the water into wine some of them felt they couldn't even say wine in the pulpit so they said jesus turned it into coffee you know People are blind in a number of ways, aren't they? People are blind to their own lifestyle. They're blind to their sin. There's, there's a, 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 a term in, in Jewish history. It's called the Avim. The Avanim. And the Avanim were the weights that people in the marketplace would use. They were stones. So if you were going to buy a pound of a grain, then you would have to find a pound or a shekel, a couple shekels 
of, of weights and put that on the balance scale so that when it balanced, you were actually getting a pound of wheat. But those were the, that was the avenue. It was a, those are the, where there were the stones, the weighted stones. But then there was the false avenue where, where corrupt, corrupt people in the, uh, in the marketplace would take different weights and so that whether they were buying or selling, they would put it to their advantage so that either you got less grain or more grain depending on whether he was buying or selling. And people today are blind. They're putting on false measures on their life. Their life is, they're measuring their life according to false weights. That can be a form of blindness. And then, here you come, a disciple of Jesus, and you're hanging out at Starbucks, or you're hanging out at your favorite, wherever your favorite hangout is. Maybe you're a student over at Mines, and you're hanging out at the student union. And here comes blind people walking in. Oh, they can see, you know, with their eyes. But they're blind in their hearts and they sit down and they ask you questions. And maybe they are, you know, blind in a number of ways and maybe they are offensive in their personalities in a number of ways. And so you don't want to talk to them for whatever reason. You become very judgmental because they're too proud or they're too arrogant or they don't even know what their humi- they don't even know what the word humility means. <laughs> but they desperately need to bump into Jesus, but they're going to bump into you first. And they need to see. And they need to see. Now Jesus says the reason this guy was born blind, he doesn't leave their theological question hanging. He says it's so that the mighty works of God can be done. You see, that's what evangelism is all about. Is the mighty work can be done. Is there anything greater than watching a guy or a gal this moment on their way to a Christless eternity? Blind as a bat spiritually? And within seconds, within moments, their destiny has been changed from a Christless hell to eternal life. And their life is being transformed. Can you think of anything greater going from blindness to sight? Why? They just bumped into Jesus. But I got to say, they kind of bumped into me first, but I told them where they could go. (laughs) And who they need to really meet. Jesus doesn't reduce this poor beggar to anything more than who he is. And that's what happens when people bump into Jesus. There's a work that only God can do. This morning, two of you reached out to me and mentioned that you had just lost a spouse or a friend lately in your life. Connie, your father... And even at funeral services, even in that time of, so it can be some of our darkest depression, guess who we bump into? Guess who's there? Wow. Sometimes we get judgmental over how much sorrow someone should feel. Really? I mean, let me say it again. Really? (laughs) Who are we to be judgmental over that? We have such blind spots as Christians, and one of them is that we get so judgmental because of our theology. You know, Jesus loves to bump into people. He doesn't mind a little contact. I remember when I played football up in Minnesota. I didn't mind contact. <laughs> I get so nervous before a game. I didn't have butterflies. I had helicopters. Uh, I was one of those guys that kind of threw up before a game. I used to do that when I first started to preach. Don't worry. I'm, I'm okay now. I'm all right. I'm all right. All right. <laughs> but I remember when I played football, I couldn't wait to go down and hit somebody. <laughs> I know it sounds terrible, but then I felt better. Contact was really good. And there are some days, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy. Uh, 
but sometimes I know that in evangelism it could be like scary it's like contact but sometimes when you sit down and you get into the gospel with somebody all of a sudden you relax and realize you're not alone and what you thought was oh I can't share my faith I don't even know how to do it and here people are bumping into me first before they're going to bump into Jesus but you know I don't have the words to say I don't have the theological degree let me just tell you a witness just shares what they know that's all so just share what you know so what are the mighty works of God what is that mighty work of God it may be seeing someone change their eternal destiny Jesus doesn't mind a little contact remember the people that bumped into Jesus I mean the list goes on and on just for a few how about blind Bartimaeus how about the paralyzed man that got let down through the roof how about the disciples how about Pilate he bumped into Jesus he couldn't even make the decision and when he was going to make the decision his wife who had bumped into Jesus says don't say anything and don't do anything let this guy go how about the high priest that bumped into Jesus he was afraid of Jesus how about the man by the pool how about you how about me You know, a daily bumping into Jesus is not a bad deal. We want to hear. Today is March 17th, 2019. Wouldn't it be something if somebody walked into First Baptist today and said, I was blind, but today I gave my life to Christ. Now, fast forward this to March 24th which is next Sunday, the same person comes back to First Baptist and says, I don't know, I walked in here on March 17th last week, and I was blind. But today I can see. Today I can see. Yeah, I bumped into Jesus. But before I did, I bumped into a few of his disciples at First Baptist. And they pointed me in the right direction. Don't let your theology become a blind spot and turn you into a judgmental person. Use it to judge correctly, but never let it be a blind spot. People need to see Jesus. Oh, by the way, who is the real blind person in this story? Could it be you? Maybe it's me. But may God bless you. May his face shine upon you. May you have a strong week. And may you see people all week long bump into Jesus because they first bumped into you. Amen.